online or one of the organizers of this event today. And I'd like to really just thank Carson very much for all of his enlightening data. I'm actually going to steal some of his data right now. Um, so as, as, as Carson had mentioned, the Asian American and the Native Hawaiian Islander communities are growing at rates faster than the white, Latinx, or black communities. From, 20, from 2000 to 2010, the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities grew by 40%, and the Asian American communities grew by 46%. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are also younger in general. Asian Americans are on average age 36. Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders are 30.4, and the national average is 37. The foreign born make up a sizable share of the Asian American population, as we know. It's actually 66%. And there's a significant share of the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population that is also foreign born, around 16%. Now here's, here's a troubling statistic. Voter registration continues to be a significant barrier for both the Asian American as well as the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Asian Americans are registered at around 56% of adult citizens, only 56%. And for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, is roughly 58%. For a white population, people register at a rate of 72%, and for African Americans, at a rate of about 73%. So there's some significant gaps here in terms of voter registration. So why is this data important? Um, why should we care? Why is this significant data important? So critical at this time. So first, the data suggests that one of the key elements to increasing our power at the ballot box is to continue on our work on naturalizing the foreign born. We're lucky that Santa Clara County has made significant investments in citizenship work. The Santa Clara County Citizenship Collaborative uh, most recently had a large citizenship day and has been doing these large citizenship days for upwards of 20 years. Um, the citizenship Citizenship Day that was at City College, upwards of a thousand people attended. There were presentations from fourteen languages. So work is being done in terms of trying to get people naturalized. But one of the other things that that the data also suggests is that in addition to the naturalization work, we need to focus on registering youth as well as newly naturalized. And you'll hear a lot more about that shortly from our panelists. So our voices really need to be heard. There are many issues of concern for our community. Uh, the current attack on family immigration, recent hate crimes, uh, the demonization of immigrants, both documented and undocumented, the Muslim travel ban, the termination of the DACA program, deportation threats to longtime refugees from Southeast Asia, healthcare access, full participation in the 2020 census. It's clear when our community can become more citizenly engaged through increased voter registration and voter turnout that we can have an impact on policies at both the national, state, and local area. So this afternoon, we're real fortunate to have two very special people to be here on our panel. We first will have Dr. Mary Ann Dewan, who is the superintendent of the Santa Clara County Office of Education, and second, Angelica Cortez, the founder of Legal Aid. <laughs> first, uh, Dr. Mary Ann Dewan is the County Superintendent of this um, County Office of Education, and thanks again for hosting this event for us today. Uh, Dr. Dewan is recognized for her expertise and experience in early learning, data-driven decision-making, special education, education reform, change leadership, and her commitment to serve the community. Dr. Dewan is an experienced educator, having served in a variety of leadership roles, including deputy special superintendent, chief schools officer, assistant superintendent, uh, executive director, director of special education, principal teacher, and she's been in education for over 30 years. Angelica Cortez has been influenced by the importance of cultural identity 
political participation, and public interest issues. Angelica founded Lee Filipino in 2015. Since Lee Filipino's formation, the organization has grown to serve hundreds of community members each year. Her professional background blends nonprofit operations, local government, and policy advocacy. She previously worked for California State Assembly member Rich Gordon and a number of policy organizations in both the Bay Area and the LA area. She's currently a director at the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and has been active in, very, in many political and nonprofit groups, including the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific American Democratic Club and the League of Women Voters. Angelica holds a BA from San Jose State, an MBA from the University of San Francisco, and she's a current doctoral student at the University of Southern California. So first, I'm gonna start with uh, Mary Ann. So can you talk about some of the statistics regarding youth eligible voters and how this data shaped your thinking on civic engagement? And then can you share with us some of the broad outlines of your Power of Democracy initiative and what the process was in developing the initiative? Great. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to be here today and to lift up education as well as youth voice as part of this really important convening. So uh, back in about 2014, we started to look at what voter registration data was looking like as well as voter turnout data and specifically how it impacts youth. And one of the um, things that we learned uh, back in 2014 was that the percentages by county throughout California were very low for voter turnout. And for example, um, in 2014, only about 8.4% of 18 to 24 year olds who were eligible, eligible to vote actually participated uh, in voting. So very significant. Now progress has been made since 2014. A lot of efforts have been underway. But even with that, um, the vote for uh, millennials is too low and also for that 18 to 24 year old group. And so that data has really shaped our thinking about what it would take and what are the things that are needed to happen to engage young people. So part of that led to um, the development of our initiative, The Power of Democracy. Um, there is a statewide um, effort and some toolkits and information that's provided out of the California Department of Education. We also have the, uh, and enjoy the support of the courts and others throughout the state and have been supported by our County Board of Education uh, in this initiative as well. It has been several years in the making. Um, it started a couple years ago where we hosted a very large convening we brought together elected officials, um, youth, uh, members of the court, um, judiciary, and others, uh, and educators, and to talk about what would be needed. And from there, with the support of the Hewlett uh, Foundation, we engaged on a, a very strong stakeholder engagement process with strategic visioning sessions, surveys, and other ways to engage and, and get voiced. And we initiated a couple of pilot programs. Our initiative really has four areas of emphasis and they kind of line up to what the voter registration and participation data would show. The first um, component is to expand access to inclusive and equitable opportunities for civic education and engagement and leadership for students, particularly ensuring that we're representing the rich diversity of our county. What we know from a lot of our data is that certain schools, certain communities, have a lot of opportunities for young people, but we have many schools and many communities where there are no opportunities or very limited. In fact, not every one of our schools, for example, has student government um, as an option. Not all of our students are able to participate in Law Day and Constitution Day and things like that. Our second one is to leverage and expand partnerships with districts and schools to promote equity and to uh, provide more communication about things like high school voter registration and that you can pre-register to vote as a young person um, in, when you're 16 years old. And then to raise awareness through outreach to parents, community, and government. I loved what was said earlier about the aunties in the community. You know, if more of our parents and grandparents and 
uh, mentors talk to young people about voting and about the issues, it would go a long way to increasing their engagement in this. And so part of our effort is to raise that awareness. And then our last um, component of our strategic initiative is to align and thread this idea of civic engagement throughout all of the work that our county office does. So you'll see through our curriculum development and teacher training that there's a civics component. We also have that in our LCAP support, through equity work, through our communications department, and other places. So you can find out more about our Power of Democracy initiative um, on our website. Uh, we also uh, did a couple pilot initiatives. I just want to highlight two real quickly. The first one was an I Voted campaign. And what this was is to lift up the voice of young people. And so we had students from our Opportunity Youth Academy talk about voting, how to register to vote, how to find out about the issues, the why of voting. Like these issues that you're going to vote about, they're issues that touch your everyday life. But young people need to hear it from their peers. And, you know, so it, and then we also learned from young people that they don't know how to vote. So they get registered, but they don't know what does that mean? Or what's the ballot? How do I deal with the ballot? And how do we remove those barriers um, to ensure that young people do vote? And so the video series did that for young people, and we're going to be expanding that this year. We also have a campaign going on right now called um, I Voted Video Campaign and Competition, and there are flyers about that out in the lobby. And the second um, pilot that we did was on-site high school voter registration days. So there are two weeks in the fall and two weeks in the spring every year that are designated for this work. This year we did something unique. We partnered with the Registrar of Voters, um, Santa Clara County with the League of Women Voters, and with the support of Supervisor Cindy Chavez, uh, we took volunteers out to schools and during lunch periods talked to young people about voting, and we registered over 1,100 students in one day. So very exciting. So for the actual plan, you know, we really did listen to young people and we uh, learned from them that they want adults to come to them, um, come where they are, where the students are, to not always expect students to come to us, um, that they feel safer in groups when they're with their peers, um, that they like to have food and fun, <laughs> as mentioned um, earlier, and that was true for our, our students as well. Um, we, they wanted to know where they could go to get more information after. Uh, social media mattered. They wanted advance notice that we were coming um, to engage with Key Club and others at the school site to help raise awareness uh, that this opportunity would be there and that that opportunity on site wouldn't be the last time. That if you needed more information um, about how to fill out the ballot or um, if you didn't get it, if you were too young to register on that particular day, when, you know, when could you get more support? So it was really the young people who helped design um, this particular support, and we, we really did listen to their voice. I, I'd say the other part, though, I would mention is we took volunteers from our office, and there was a little bit of fear at first. Um, yeah, uh, employees saying, I haven't been on a high school campus in like 20 years. Uh, you know, are the, are the kids scary? Um, you know, are, do they want to see us? You know, how are we going to talk to a 16 year old about voting? And so we did provide training and orientation for the adults. And I think that's a very important thing, too, because we want to talk to them as equals and not um, really look down to the young people, but really that we're engaging them as partners and inviting them in to this really important work of civic engagement. So if some of the folks here might be interested in perhaps volunteering in your ongoing efforts um, at the high school level, how, how could they do that? 
Well, I'm really glad you asked that question because <laughs> our, um, we are ready to take this pilot project to a countywide um, level. And on our Power of Democracy website, we have a sign-up sheet where uh, you can go online and let us know if you're interested in joining us and going out to school sites. Um, you can um, also just, if you are only comfortable with a particular neighborhood school, you can let us know that. But just sign up on the website and then we'll be reaching out to provide um, opportunities for orientation, setting up the dates for all the school site visits. We're also going to be partnering with the League of Women Voters. So in addition to the high school voter registration days, there are opportunities if you want to go out and teach lessons um, in classes as well. So just let us know if that you're interested and we'll be sure to, to get you engaged. And I have been told that if you have your smartphone out and if you zero in and scan that, that, that QR code will take you directly to the page to sign up as a volunteer. So if any of you, well, I know all of you have smartphones. I, I don't. But if you have your smartphone, go ahead and do it now, or we'll leave it up for a little while. Um, Okay. Yes, and also at the post-event, um, I know that information is going to be sent out to all of the participants. We'll also have a direct link to that website um, if you're interested in signing up. Okay, so Pastor Michael is with Angelica. Um, so uh, Angelica, Lee Filipino has been one of the key partners in our local civic engagement collaborative. So can you talk in general about some of the, the work you've been doing? Yeah, sure, and good afternoon, everyone, and especially to the folks in the back. I know that when I was sitting back there, it felt like I was listening to a very dynamic podcast, so I'm talking to all of you back there as well. For some texture, who is Lee Filipino? Well, we're the minnow in the room amongst whales that are doing awesome work, but I give a lot of shout-outs and love to the small grassroots organizations in this room among us because we are in your company. We run Lead Filipino, we are San Jose based. We are run on the might and the heart and the gusto of volunteers. Uh, we've been around four years. We meet monthly and for just general texture, none of us are quitting our day jobs yet to work for Lead Filipino. So we really appreciate these spaces where we can convene in conversation and positivity to learn in best practices what everyone's doing in collaboration. So thank you. Lead Filipino, what we do in short is that we create an ecosystem that involves the Filipinos and the Filipinas in Santa Clara County, and we are expanding some of our work up to Union City, so in Southern Alameda County. So we create opportunities and design programs that help educate and involve our community in civic engagement. So all of our mission, our values, and our ethos is all around how are we creating spaces that are accessible and that also work on, because a resounding theme today was all of the imperatives. We ought to do this. We need to do this. We need to engage our folks. So our starting point is all around Filipino studies. So we have a program that we run every summer and what it does, it's interdisciplinary, so it ties in elements of Filipino and Filipina identity and how we approach the, topic, the topics of political and civic engagement. So talking about our identity, the fact that 140,000 of the one and a half million Filipinos and Filipinas in the state of California reside in Santa Clara County. We're the fourth largest of our 1.5 million in the state of California, in Santa Clara County, and 44% of our 4 million diaspora in the United States resides in California. So what are we doing to awaken this sleeping giant and understand the role of context in our work? So we talk a lot about context, psychology, Filipino and Filipina psychology, which doesn't look too, too different from if we're going to talk about Asian American and Pacific Islander experiences, but we really orient our pedagogy around the Filipino and Filipina narrative in a way that helps our students and our families understand civic engagement and its imperatives in their daily lives. So what do we do around civic engagement? Well, we have a monthly uh, partnership where we are at the county's naturalization ceremonies, and I want to give some love to Katrina Figueroa on our team who's sitting back there. 
She has ran our um, she has ran our recruitment efforts and engagement with students at San Jose State University, Santa Clara University, De Anza College, and um, uh, Cal State uh, East Bay, where we really work with the Filipino American student uh, collegiate organizations. So that's our strength. We work with students through those outlets. And we work to identify campus ambassadors in a way that we use that as our recruitment approach to have a monthly presence at the county's naturalization ceremony. So that's voter registration. Second, we work in partnership and in, in regional coordination with other Filipino and Filipina American-based, community-based organizations, nonprofit agencies, and student groups. So who is that? We also have one of our friends here from uh, UC Davis's Carlos Bulasan Center for Filipino Studies. Kat Nassal's back there, PhD student in cultural studies. So the Bulasan Center for Filipino Studies is the first of its kind in the nation, a center dedicated uniquely to Filipino and Filipina uh, data and research, looking at outcomes, um, looking at our, um, just our outcomes in terms of education, home ownership, veteran status, and we partnered up with the Bulletin Center for Filipino Studies over a year ago. And our call to our community was working in a regional way, so organizations in the city and county of San Francisco and Alameda County, around putting together a policy platform that is not and can no way ever be entirely distinct to the Filipino and Filipino American community, but asking our students, our educators, our historians, our parents, our families, the Filipino small business community, in a symposium at UC Davis, what are the issues, quite like we're asking today, what are the issues impacting the Filipino and Filipina American experience? We know that PNIs are overrepresented and exploited as domestic caregivers in light of forced migration. We know that issues in the Filipino community around um, again, voter registration and engagement. So through this symposium with about 25 agencies represented, we fastened a policy platform that we took to Sacramento. The policy platform was based on passing Assembly Bill 331, which was referenced earlier, which is the, by Assemblyman uh, Canson True, which would, if passed, mandate ethnic studies as a California public high school graduation requirement in the academic year 2024 to 2025. Can I get a, can I get a holler at that? Like, Woo! Woo! so we advocated on AB331. We, advocate, we advocated on domestic workers issues. We partnered with the um, Coalition of Domestic Workers for California. And then we worked with Assemblyman Rob Bonta's office on a series of bills with PICO, which is a statewide housing network on um, <clears throat> tenant, increased tenant protection, so AB 36 and AB 1481, which was anti-rent gouging, to address, as a Filipino community, to show elected leaders in Sacramento, but oh, by the way, bringing students to also talk to these legislators, just really trying to activate our community and understand what it means to touch these processes that we know are often shrouded in mystery or disconnected from the experience. So yes, we had to ask students to miss school for the day, but we promised them an experience that would more or less be a lot more memorable than maybe the history class that they were missing. Mm -hmm. So that's just another example. And um, yeah, I think I named it that. <laughs> so I want to just drill down a little bit more in detail about the, the swearing-in ceremony. So I understand it actually occurs at the Heritage Theater in Campbell, and it's usually once a month. And it can, can, the dates that are coming up right away are June 20th, July 25th, August 26th, 22nd, and September 19th. And it's usually from like 9 to 3, roughly. So can you maybe just share a little bit about exactly how it works for people who are there and what the experiences have been in terms of um, registering a newly naturalized citizen? Yeah, so I can speak on over two years of, of having this opportunity with respect to just public engagement and what that has meant anecdotally and experientially for our students. So 2017 was our first summer that we as Lead Filipino got to work alongside Asian Law Alliance, Nick Kawada and his team, and a number of other familiar faces um, 
at these ceremonies, and we recruited students from Santa Clara University and San Jose State, and we actually had a student write a reflective piece that we featured in our newsletter. This student in particular, she um, is fluent in Tagalog, and you know, uh, as Dr. Data said earlier, the, just the symbolism and the presence of, a, of an ANSI, an Atita. So Atita is ANSI in uh, Filipino, and in the story that this student recounted that she submitted for our newsletter, she wrote about just the emotional, um, the unexpected emotional response she had when she saw Atita come up with her uh, American, her little American flag and just the elation in her expression with her daughters. And once she saw that one of our volunteers spoke Tagalog, just like unleashed her excitement and her expression in a way that our student felt so privileged and, and just humbled to have shared that experience and to have been that first person that, that you know, Tita was able to encounter with respect to registering to vote and just the pride and the memory and the experience being so palpable and in one that we that we cherish and we celebrate. So so how how has that looked for us across a two year span? We've been able to engage students that wouldn't otherwise maybe give the time of day to the importance of voter registration. The way we also sort of volunteer our students to to also engage in the naturalization ceremonies is the summer program that I mentioned which is our Awareness and Action Program. It starts later this month, and for the past four years, we've hosted it over on the east side of San Jose at Asian American Recovery Services. It's called Awareness and Action. Eight-week interdisciplinary designed by uh, yours truly and a number of our other organizers who have studied education, who have studied political science, and who bring a mix of art and science to our curriculum development, but it orients again around not just Filipino and Filipino experiences, but the broader Asian American community, Asian American Pacific Islander experiences, and then really relating back the context of what it means to live in the highest cost region in the country. So we talk about these real issues because at the end of the day, what we're thwarting and what we're coming up against, again, this is all anecdotal. I have not successfully shocked any type of research funding to, to look at the scientific study behind this yet, but what, we're, what we fight against is how do we get young folks and families, because we have had families come through our program, understand and bring, how do we have the conversation when at the fore of their mind, they're worried about survival. They're worried about the fact that they are one rent increase away from possibly needing to move. So when you're worried about clothes on your back and your shelter and your housing, how do you approach someone and talk about voter registration and civic engagement? So we start our work based on trust. And so creating a space that brings folks back and it talks about issues that, and, and, and where we talk about issues that are relevant to their experiences. So, um, yeah. So Angela, you speak about your work with a lot of passion. So I just like to ask you, what, what do you do this work? That's going a little off the, off the planned questions. Um, just a few seconds here. Um, I cite a number of, of influences. Why? There are a number of influences that I draw from this community alone also that are personally, so there's a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. I started my career and I still work um, in the nonprofit world. I firmly see myself growing and contributing and giving to the nonprofit community. So um, the lady earlier that asked about competition in terms of how are, how are small organizations position to compete for grant funding when these applications are complex. And they ask for a number of uh, evaluation data that's outcome, outcome driven. What are your outputs? What are your inputs? So what I bring to my work is a combination. And I think it's a very complicated answer. And I don't want to go on a long-winded diatribe, but pretty much I do this work 
to serve in a nonprofit sense around health and human services. I bring my orientation around being a proud, queer, Kenai, second generation, Bay Area born and raised, wanting to give our community access and exposure and wanting to address just generations of generations of our psychology where we were socialized to think that these tables, and there are many tables as we know, when we talk about needing to be at that table, there's a myriad of tables. So being that person that can help contribute to a movement, because I'm one of many in terms of regional coordination that works to involve the Filipino and Filipino American community in broader conversations, in broader dialogue, but in a multi-generational way. So we, yes, we work with students. Yes, we work with younger families. But we work in concert with a number of other Philan agencies that are working with seniors, that are working with veterans. We have this partnership with the Bulls on Center over at UC Davis. So how are we working is just one of the many pieces to help create a stronger movement. And that's what I want to devote my, my life to. That's what I want to devote my work to. It's been a 12 years running strong now. Thank you.